Yes, ladies and gentlemen, we are live for the final installment of our pilot series of meeting points. I'm Oresis Tringiris. And I'm George Nicolau. And welcome everyone from Nicosia Cyprus who's listening to us live. And hello to everyone to you who are listening to us posterior and viewing our video as well in posterior. We're going to upload this on YouTube. George is our final installment of our first six series. Uh, goodness willing, uh, we'll be back in September Yes, with more rounds uh, and with more uh, issues that concern the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, like human rights, the environment, etc. What's our take for today, man? So today we're going to talk about child soldiers. Uh, what constitutes a child soldier? Yeah, what basically? is a child soldier? Yeah. That, that's our first thing. Where are the limits? And we're going to hear it from our guests, it's, it's not for me to say it. Our guests have more experience on these things. Mm -hmm. We have done our homework and we are live. Lis and ladies and gentlemen, you can leave your comments on lemonyradio.com. It's the more and more box on the right hand side. And we'll be able to see your comments live and uh, maybe your question as well. Uh, let's start with introducing our guests. Yeah. First of all, I would like to say a warm thank you to your invitation to talk uh, today about the most interesting topic. Uh, my name is Dimitra Loizu. I am a lecturer at UCLan Cyprus. I'm also a practicing lawyer. And uh, now, in terms of child soldiers, where, how did my specialization arose? And um, my PhD focused on the establishment and the early case of the International Criminal Court. And the International mm -hmm. Criminal Court and its statute was the first formulation of child soldiering as a war crime. So it basically brought the question of child soldiering within the aim, within the scope of individual criminal responsibility. Now, as Joanna is more expert uh, on the human rights sector, and she, um, I will leave it to her, up to that stage, um, the protection of children in, in general was more suited or best perceived to be a human rights issue. So now we have a more firm uh, approach, a more robust approach when it comes to individual criminal responsibility. Uh, how does someone who recruits children voluntarily or involuntarily may end up before the deck? So this is what I've been doing. And interestingly so, uh, the war crime of child soldiering is one of the most commonly charged, charged crimes in the ICC. Now, all of the verdicts up to date, but one, have included the war crime of child soldiering within the charges. Mm -hmm. So it is a matter of growing interest. And what I've been dealing with is the extent to which um, these individuals' children are or are not lawful targets. Now, if someone is responsible for recruiting a child in armed conflict, a child which is recruited immediately under international humanitarian law is a lawful target. So where does the boundary lie? And should the court provide for a broad interpretation of the crime, but at the same time expose the children to lawful attacks? So this is what I've been dealing in the last few months. Yes, Joanna, can you please start from the top? Who are you? Where are you? What have you been doing? and uh, give us your primer, I repeat the question, for your research and your work on si child soldiers and on the issue in general. Joanna, we uh, go to you, thank you. Can anyone hear me? Yes, we can. Introduce yourself, please, thank you. Perfect. So I'm Ioana Vinopoulou, and um, I hold a PhD in philosophy and international affairs and human rights, and have worked for the Hellenic Mission in international organizations in Geneva, and the European Commission, and um, I work on advocacy of human rights and now the child children's reparation case. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Uh, friends, because I was, uh, I was away trying to configure out, figure out the, the connection, so what are the limits of a ch child soldier? Uh, we, had, we had some practical questions before. Uh, for example, let's say there's a, there's a conflict, there's an ar armed conflict, uh, official or unofficial, in a region, and uh, some children in those in that region, they are forced by militiamen or whatever to just uh, pass uh, some food, bring them food. So they're not holding a gun, but they are bringing food. So they are contributing thus to one of the sides of the conflict, or maybe they pass messages 
or they are they are watching out for them and in case someone uh, the enemy comes they just ring something so where are the limits uh, for child soldiers if i can generalize the question a bit yeah uh, what is a child soldier and uh, uh, how do you define one as a child soldier so uh, it's for both of you yes. uh, joanna uh, dimitra started dimitra before, ah so yeah you're, you're, you're saying okay go on dimitra yeah i'm just going to well i start from the end and go to the beginning and joanna can join in <laughs> All right, thanks for that. Now, uh, a child soldier is not a child who is found on the front line, is not someone who necessarily carries a gun. This is very clear. So we have direct and indirect activities, which if they have, if there is a link between that activity and the contact of hostilities, the child who is a courier, a bodyguard, who is carrying food, may end up being considered to be a lawful target and that's a child soldier right you said lawful target uh, so uh okay i'll go i take it step back what is international humanitarian law about it's about um how the, the game is carried out is the rules of the game so if even if someone uh, uh, this might sound very crude but if someone is killed during an armed conflict this is perfectly legitimate if they are active combatants if they are soldiers so international humanitarian law distinguishes between combatants and non-combatants which in a very generalized way we have the civilian population which includes children yeah. so a child or anyone else who as long as they do not take part in hostilities they are entitled to protections under international humanitarian law and thus they may not be a target of an attack mm -hmm. is that a good point for you uh, joanna to join in uh, in the conversation because uh, you joined it early what di what is your take on that joanna well lex specialis is always so interesting but i would start from the beginning as aristotle would say by definition so a child associated with an armed force or armed group refers to any person as dimitra would put it would say uh, below uh, 18 years of age who is or has been recruited or used by an armed force or armed group in any capacity boy or girl. This is according, of course, to the Paris Principle, uh, Paris Principles on Involvement of uh, Children in Armed Conflict, uh, 2007. Um, though there is the definition complementary to this, but not official, stating that any girl or boy below the age of 18 who is recruited or used by an armed force or armed group in any capacity uh, defines our, as a child soldier. Uh, well, where, I think the where is uh, of particular importance in, um, in this conversation, we have to place, the, to, to, to place a little bit the locky we're interested in. So according to the 2020 report of the Secretary General of uh, Children and Armed Conflict, there are 57 non-state actors and seven state actors uh, uh, responsible for committing grave violations affecting children in situations of armed conflict, although the phenomenon um, is going on in over 20 countries. In elaborating further on the where, on the specific geographical area uh, of the after Arab Spring countries, which concerns us on our file on child soldiers, uh, the child soldiers' right to reparation case, I have to give some uh, explanatory fact, right? So, uh, the estimated number of foreign fighters in Iraq and Syria alone since 2011 is set between 30,000 and 42,000 a significant number of which have been minors. While well reports of the recruitment and use of children by armed groups such as ISIS uh, subsided as they, uh, the so-called caliphate uh, started losing control over territory in 2018, the overall number of verified cases of deployed children remained high. 
In some cases, it is reported that rather than being liberated, these children were actually simply passed on to the opposing side, becoming part of the spoils. Uh, the intervention by the Saudi-led coalition, which includes, the, uh, of course, the United Arab Emirates, uh, began in March 2015 and uh, led by the Saudis. The intervention claims to be fighting to rescue Yemen from the Iran-backed Houthi rebels, right? So in Yemen, child soldiers were uh, often brought by Sudan, including Darfur, fighting as mercenaries, accounting to 20 and sometimes 40% of the uh, Sudanese battalion in Yemen. Saudi Arabia, of course, denies the reports of the New York, New York Times, but there are those within the Security Council that uh, attribute responsibility for this practice to the Saudi Crown. The report also states that in December 2018, Riyadh offered impoverished Sud Sudanese families up to $10,000 to send their children to fight in Yemen. In 2018 alone, more than a thousand Yemeni children were forced to fight. And the ultimate responsibility for the deployment lies squarely within uh, the Saudi regime. In December 2018, the UN were able to verify that actually 2,721 children were recruited to fight for all sides. This practice has apparently uh, gained hold in Libya as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, oh, that was the next question would be, George. I mean, I'm wondering, uh, George, uh, what are the variations and what is your question? Yeah, I, um, I see here in the ahrw.org page. Yeah. Um, I didn't find the name, sorry. Yeah, it's okay. So, uh, so the fight on the front line participate in suicide mission, the act of spies, messengers, uh, or lookouts. Yeah. And guests may be forced into sexual slavery. Yeah, it's not something we hear yeah. very often, uh, how our girls are being used in, in the war machine. We had examples, historical examples, uh, well maybe a lot of historical examples in Vietnam uh, and into sex sexual slavery or even working as both spies and also as uh, basically sex slaves. We have a prostitution. And uh, I see Dimitra is raising your hand and you want to have an intervention on that. Okay, go on. Uh, b um, now, in terms of sexual violence, sexual violence, in addition to being an overlooked aspect of the armed conflict until the Second World War was a collateral aspect of armed conflict, which was not even prosecuted per se. Um, the sexual violence inflicted by female uh, child soldiers, not only female child soldiers, also male child soldiers, has been a neglect, vastly neglected. And why was the reason for this? Because these children are subjected to various forms of sexual violence by members of their own group. What does that mean? It means that international humanitarian law does not even come into place, does not become applicable, because International humanitarian law is there to regulate how opposing sides deal with each other. So the fact that children and child soldiers, both male and female, may have to endure sexual violence, for example, we have the phenomenon of bushwives, um, has been uh, has come to the notice, for example, of the International Criminal Court, but in terms of prosecution, it has been characterized by widespread impunity. Now, I want to add a couple of things to what Joanna has said. Uh, now, there is a push towards a st what we call a straight 18 position in terms of not involving children in the contact of hostilities. This is, as of yet, not universally accepted. And this is not a problem in countries like Libya or where ISIS is active. I mean, we will be surprised that even um, when it comes to countries within the EU, children below the age of 18 may end up in active combat. So it is a, it is a, um, a widespread phenomenon which is um, relevant not only in uh, the cases that we have in mind, and also it has become more and more widespread and serious because of the fluidity of war. We don't have interstate wars nowadays. We have prolonged wars between different non 
state armed groups, we have change of alliances, territories changing um, control. I mean, I ISIS lost uh, control of the caliphate. So this provides the fertile ground for further exploitation of children. Wow, that, that's very tough to hear. Yes. And especially with this. Uh, are there any exemplar uh, court cases that have been going or, uh, ha or in the past, uh, I'm, I'm addressing this question to you, Joanna and Dimitra, where there has been a landmark change uh, in, the, in the situation that actually helped the child soldiers. Of course, it, we have to have in mind what is the stage of conflict. Is it post-conflict or is it during the active conflict? So, Joanna, what is your first take on that? Go on, Joanna. Well, with the Rome Statute of the ICC, I will have to go back to the, uh, the history a little bit. Uh, the rights of victims of serious violations in international law were affirmed. For the first time, victims were, uh, victims were acknowledged as stakeholders in international criminal proceedings, and numerous articles related to the right to reparation bear evidence to this effect. But there were major debates also regarding whether reparations orders from the ICC could be aimed not only at convicted individuals, but also at states. States were uh, worried of the potential inclusion of state responsibility um, in the context of reparations, and the exclusion of such reference was a compromise to ensure the approval of Article 75 uh, of the Rome Statute. We have to note states suffering from, uh, as Robertson would put it, human rights amnesia here, uh, deliberately declined to uh, actually allow ICC to order reparations against governments. And as uh, stated, uh, this omission um, reflects one of the key witnesses in the current philosophy behind the international justice movement which denies the uh, existence of collective responsibility in order to fasten upon the blameworthy individual. Where crimes against humanity are concerned, the two are not mutually excluded. And that's the sure thing. So in the ILO case, um, May had to compensate 427 child soldiers recruited by the Congolese warlord with $10 million, um, though state responsibility entails positive duties and may uh, also be incurred when the state has omitted or failed uh, to demonstrate due diligence to prevent violations. Right. Thank you, Joanna. Uh, what is your take on that, uh, Dimitra? Do you have a comment, something to say, a comment, or before we go to the next question? Yeah, we we'll wait, no problem. Uh, no, I don't have much to what Joanna has said. I mean, the ICC has brought a change in that for the first time, the victims uh, can qualify as parties to the proceeding. They make an application, and if they meet the prerequisites, they have a standing in the case, and they have a legal representative. That said, though, it's, an, it's a completely different thing as to what happens on the ground. I mean who is entitled to compensation and reparation at the end of the day? The victims who are involved in the proceedings or what, what happens to the wider community? And we also have the compromise when it comes to state responsibility, which uh, Joanna uh, has elaborated very clearly. We live in an era of pro prolonged conflicts, as uh, Dimitra and Joanna, we, we both said before. And uh, there are many complications, I understand, you said before, uh, uh, Dimitra, that uh, war there are warlords changing sides or the, the losing side has to ba basically uh, give up their children by force uh, to the winning side. So my question is, uh, what happens to the case in the case of reparations by states when in conflicts where there is no official participation of state-level actors? What happens to the cases where there is conflict, but uh, the responsibility of a, sta of, of a, a recognized state is, is, not, is not very clear. What happens to those cases? Or what happens, let's put it easily, what happens to wars that there not everybody agrees it's a war, to put it this way. So if it's not a war, that means uh, the international law may or may not apply, or some stakeholders 
may consider or consider that the law should apply or not apply in this case. Uh, did, that, did that make any, any sense? And Joanna, if you want to take it on from here. Yes, take it on. Joanna should uh, be the one to step in here. <laughs> All right, then. Joanna is yours. I assume she's more, uh, much more focused and familiar uh, with the reparations than I am. Yeah. Well, thank you for this question, uh, uh, both of you, the three of you. Uh, well, regardless of how children are recruited, whether abducted or recruited as foreign fighters, and uh, of their roles, um, uh, of, uh, and re regardless of their roles, uh, child soldiers are victims, although treated as survivors, which is uh, well-respected, but not a legal term to generate legal results. So until now, we were just hoping on a long healing process of reintegration. But jurisprudence on reparations by human rights courts and entities do set important precedents and standards. However, major challenges um, are uh, visible in their limited and, um, let's say, stretched capacity to monitor compliance by states. Comprehensive measures are required to be undertaken at the national level in order to ensure that the number of beneficiaries is expanded and that the most vulnerable victims are identified and prioritized when it comes to redress claims. In uh, Prosecutor versus uh, Dailo versus Thomas Lubanga Dailo uh, case is uh, uh, elaborated in depth um, the how reparations proceedings should be improved, especially during the implementation stage. Um, so reparation uh, was reaffirmed as an internationally recognized human right with five key elements uh, according to the principles, one of them being compensation. The ultimate goal of reparation is to restore human dignity. Reparations are invested with the need to redress gross violations of human rights. Um, therefore, the damage to the project of life should be considered and repair. Right, so George, you have a question, yeah, and I have, I have another question. Yeah. Go on with yours first. So what happens to those children that survive a war, or the, the, for, of them being soldiers? What happens to them when they grow up? Because this happened not now, not in the recent five years. I remember uh, studying this in 2009 when Uganda was at war with itself. Yeah, what happens to what those children? What I mean happens to those children? I mean, how they, they yeah, what uh, happens? Are, are they yeah. rehabit rehabilitated back into the society? What are the precautions taken for them? If there are any precautions taken for them? Are there examples or are there, is there any uh, movement to uh, make states in international law to stipulate that you also have the responsibility to rehabilitate, rehabilitations beyond reparations? Uh, is who wants to go, Joanna? Well, we have to go on the why um, child soldiers as a, a, a fact uh, is uh, important today. I think this is the most important to understand where the children are uh, coming from, what they've been through, what uh, I talked before about survivors uh, not giving legal results. And I talked about a long healing process to reintegration. Uh, well, children, children um, have become more uh, vulnerable due to new tactics of warfare, the absence of clean battlefields, the use of tactics of extreme violence, the increasing number of diversity of armed groups that add to the complexity of these conflicts. And uh, of course, the deliberate targeting of traditional safe havens, uh, such as uh, schools and hospitals. Of growing concern is the use of children to carry or plant explosive devices. In the past few years, we uh, have witnessed an increase in the use of child suicide bombers. The detention of children is another concern. They can be detained because of their alleged association with an armed group 
or because uh, they have allegedly participated in hostilities instead of being considered victims of the adults who actually recruited them, children are considered security threats. So when you... they are arrested, they are often detained without... So Thai soldiers have historically been considered a challenge linked to sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, it is estimated that uh, more than one million children were forced into battle from Sudan to Congo. But since 2011, state failure and civil strife have allowed militias operating in North Africa and the Middle East to enlist children en masse. Other states in the region have facilitated this practice by recruiting and transporting children on behalf of their allies, as well as by providing weapons and ammunition, engaging in war by proxy. The practice, of course, has become commonplace uh, throughout the Middle East. Thank you very much, uh, Joanna. Dimitra, back to you. Do, ah, yes. Wait a minute. Sorry. We're in the middle of Magairos Avenue, as you can hear, and as you can see behind us. So people are waving at us. So I apologize for the delay. The hearing me. I mean, there is some delay when I unmute my button. Now, continue to from uh, from what Joanna has said. Uh, it's very difficult to provide a generalized answer. Okay, what happens to these children? Uh, first of all, do we have an end to the conflict? Do we have a frozen conflict? Do we have an official end to hostilities and the adoption of transitional justice measures which include the reintegration of people in society, including children, of course? Um, and another thing to bear in mind is how do these children actually end up becoming part of an armed group? Mm -hmm. Now, there is, uh, at the end of the day, under international criminal law, there is, it does not matter whether these children are end up there voluntarily or by force. Yeah. Because, I mean, we also have the question, okay, are they capable of giving a valid consent? I mean, quite often they are being um, given by their own family because that's uh, the best way out for them to survive possibly or to provide an income to the family. So it, it is, I mean, each conflict it's quite unique. I mean, as John has said, we had an increased number of uh, suicide bombers. I mean, this was especially employed by Boko Haram in northern Nigeria. I mean, young children being sent in, in the market or a busy place uh, to spread death and terror. So uh, it is um, very much uh, fragmented picture as to what happens to these children and whether we have reparations in place for them. But quite often we do not. Uh, is there any precedent which uh, a good example uh, from the past that uh, there have been reparations that they benefited uh, most with the children? I'm asking well, both of you. A, a good example is what Joan has mentioned is the Lubanga Dilo case in the ICC, which was the first uh, judgment of the International Criminal Court, and it only involved charges of child surgery. And that, I mean, and it, um, we had a prolonged proceedings in that respect. I don't know if Joanna wants to add something there with respect yeah. to the Lubanga case. Mm -hmm. Joanna, do you want to add something to the, yeah, go on, yeah. We cannot hear you. Okay, can you speak a bit slower, maybe, Joanna? Okay. Um, uh, is it okay? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, uh, well, uh, states should uh, bear primary responsibility to provide reparations for victims of armed conflict. Uh, this argument is supported both on legal grounds as well as on general moral obligations to promote and ensure equity and fairness and non-discrimination. It is clear that the state has positive duties to prevent violations and demonstrate due diligence. It has become increasingly frequent that states uh, have been found to carry a degree of responsibility for a mission to protect civilians when the perpetrators have been non-state actors. 
to this effect, there is um, actually a, a convergent approach in international law on state responsibility, which is illustrated in Article 2 of the International Law Commission articles on state responsibility uh, and the official commentary of the ICRC on Article 91 of the Additional Protocol to the Geneva Convention, which also affirms that state responsibility may be incurred by omission when due diligence to prevent violation uh, from taking uh, place have not, of course, been demonstrated. Well, jurisprudence from uh, regional human rights uh, courts has further consolidated uh, uh, positive obligations of the state to prevent violations and demonstrate due diligence, including in the context of armed conflict and exa examples of uh, such cases are uh, Mahmoud uh, Kaya versus Turkey and Mapiripan massacre versus Colombia. The consistent and uh, convergent affirmation of positive obligations of the state translates into an obligation to assume responsibility for uh, such violations, including reparations. As for moral grounds, if you're interested, if I can go on, uh, I would say that the difficulties victims face in seeking reparations have been extensively documented in a relation to international criminal law and the transitional justice initiatives in the uh, given state uh, case studies on reparations. It is immoral, uh, unfair and discriminatory that uh, disproportionate amounts of resources are spent on offenders and the demobilization of former combatants while their victims uh, are left empty-handed. Uh, as noted in the report of the Secretary General on the rule of law and transitional justice in conflict and post-conflict societies, uh, states have an obligation to act not only against perpetrators, but also on behalf of victims, including uh, through the provision of reparations. Will have been our, so I think, thanks, man. That will have been uh, our next question, what should be done? But you already started answering it, uh, uh, Joanna. Uh, let's, uh, uh, okay, uh, you want to add something before we move to Dimitra, Joanna? Or Dimitra, do you want to intervene something now? Can I make a short contribution? Okay, I mean, all right. I agree with what Joanna has said. Now, uh, Joanna has touched upon a very challenging aspect when it comes to armed conflict, uh, non-state actors. Yeah. What are their rights and what are their obligations? Mm -hmm. We have traditionally perceived war as between country X and country Y. Now the vast majority of armed conflicts mm -hmm. are, inter are taking place within uh, state borders and they involve, they, sometimes they involve only non-state actors. So there is a growing understanding both in international humanitarian law and international criminal law that this I would say in inverted commas, organizations, entities. I mean, there are certain criteria as to what constitutes a non-state actor, but there is, yes. this is not a place to elaborate on it. Yes. But, uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. They have an increase in the number, not only of rights, but of responsibilities as to how they behave during an armed conflict. Mm -hmm. Joanna, do you including want, yes. the recruitment of children, of course. Including the recruitment of children, right. Joanna, what was your take? Take it on from here. Uh, excuse me, I lost you a little bit. Oh, okay, all right. Uh, what is your take uh, after the intervention of Dimitra right now, especially on the non-state actors? Oh. Non-state actors. I would just uh, uh, stick with a little uh, conclusion. Um, well, historically, international law viewed reparation as already mentioned, as an interstate measure. However, the, of, uh, the convergence of uh, a number of developments in international law over the past decades has produced important shifts, and this is uh, the important thing. Um, uh, what is also important is to uh, finally accept uh, the due diligence and the uh, state responsibility for a mission. Mm -hmm. State or non-state actors, the state has the responsibility to protect. Right. 
let's take a, a very short break. You are listening, ladies and gentlemen, to Meeting Points every Monday or about 6 to 8 Cyprus time. Uh, it's me, Oresto Tenginis, and I'm George Nicolau. You can ask your questions for today's uh, show. subject mm -hmm. or show to moviebox at lemonyradio.com. And we have with us uh, two very distinguished guests. Thank you for being with us, Dimitra and Joanna. Uh, it's a very hard topic. I, I, it, on purpose, I took this small break because I, there are many things to consider. So let, let's leave the conversation open. Uh, we have uh, we are done with questions so far, uh, except that uh, it's a very hard topic. How can you deal with it when working with that? You hear all sort of uh, well very disturbing stories. How do you deal with that? And if I cannot, what can we do? And what can we do? What As individuals. Yeah, and as media, we are a community media radio station here in the middle of, uh, of Nicosia. So, these are the two questions for, for now. H how do you deal with the emotional effect of researching into such issue? And what can we, as uh, citizens and as media, can do to contribute uh, positively to this subject? I'll it's an open-ended uh, question, so we leave it to you. Whoever wants to go first. I, I can get started. I mean, it's a... I'm predominantly working on international criminal law, so this is part of my everyday uh, work. But the, the reason I got interested in such a, um, I won't say unpleasant, but um, very much disturbing topic is because it exists in such a widespread scale and it happened next to us. And we are in complete. Um, ignorance as to what happens to vulnerable individuals who are caught in the midst of an armed conflict, being children, being women, being the elderly. It's uh, worse, uh, won't end, but, uh, well, I'm hoping that it will end, but uh, it's about protecting the vulnerable and those who are not involved. Uh, in the conduct of hostilities, including children. And without now, having any choice. Mm -hmm. um, Go on. You were about to say, And without having any choice, they, uh, you just have a normal life one day, and the next day, look, there is war, and now you you are a child, but you are, he has a gun. They don't even have a choice. You have to fight for your life. Yeah. And uh, we need to understand also that sometimes um, Going to war for, uh, I don't know how it will sound, but going to war for uh, some children is a better alternative for them to survive. I mean, how, how do we approach this? This is uh, not only disturbing, but it's, uh, uh, it's completely against any sense of humanity. It's a fundamental moral question as well. It's beyond just the war crime. It's a, it's, it's a deeply moral question. Exactly. Joanna, you want to take it from here? From here? Well, many child soldiers end up desensitized to violence, uh, which can psychologically damage them, of course. It's understandable. Many are traumatized by what they have been forced to do or have witnessed. Uh, children need to undergo reintegration. It's a long healing process uh, to help them return to civilian life. Girls face the additional difficulty of social stigma uh, attached to the belief they have been engaged in sexual activity. Most children, um, uh, child soldiers, have missed out, of course, on school and need additional education in order to feed themselves and make a more stable life for themselves. But it's all a, a, a matter of uh, dignity. Uh, while the legal basis for claiming the right to reparation for victims of serious human rights violations have become firmly entrenched, the uh, the, um, uh, we acknowledge some of the uh, challenges that have arisen and that remain in order to assert that the right can be effectively exercised in practice. They have to be uh, provided with a reparation. It's their right. And it's uh, a matter of questioning the legal order. 
uh, while human rights mechanisms have increased their efficiency, expanded their jurisprudence in the realm of reparations and sought to undertake measures to monitor compliance by states, such mechanisms were not designed to address large numbers of victims in conflict situation. This worrisome lacuna needs to be addressed. The concept of state responsibility uh, is maturing and should be maturing more alongside a customary right now to uh, receive reparations. Uh, there is something too that we would like our listeners to understand. George uh, made up a. Yeah, a Dimitra yes. just blew my phone word away in Singapore when you said that uh, it's a better alternative for some children to participate in a war. Why is it a better alternative? Why is it a better alternative? Um, um, between life and death. <laughs> oh, thanks very much. Oh, <laughs> you're blowing us away. Okay. Uh, and, yeah. um, um, an issue which uh, we haven't, I mean, touched upon, and there is, I mean, there is a growing discussion on it, and. Um, I mean, it's still, I mean, the situation is not quite clear to what extent, I mean, I don't, I don't necessarily agree with it, but to what extent are children as passive as we perceive them? There, are, there is a certain portion of academics that say, okay, children should have to a certain extent some responsibility, that they are, not, that they are much more capable of reflection, survival, and adjusting to to a uh, horrendous situation. So, I mean, and that's just food for thought. I mean, I don't necessarily agree with it, but we also have um, this uh, thought on the table. So, I'm sorry, George, if, I, um, <laughs> if this sounds even more disturbing. Yeah, it's, it's a very difficult subject, and we knew this. And, uh, okay, we're doing some jokes in between because we need to cope with this subject. It's really hard subject, and I want to ask, sorry, from our viewers, from our listeners and viewers on YouTube, if we are um, coping with jokes, let's say. Yeah, so speaking of, of jokes and us being on this side of the table and you two being on the other side of the table, how does media deal with this issue? So what would be your, your critique on media on covering any conflicts and the involvement of children fairly or unfairly because for example I understand that there are war childs in Cyprus too in my neighborhood I know there are children who came from Syria from conflict societies their parents uh, they have been forced into conflict and they are since then missing and uh, th they are being considered as basically war children maybe they had an involvement so that's, a, that's, a, that's one uh, subject that the media sometimes takes upon. So what is your critique? Because you are, from the legal perspective, from your academia perspective, what is your critique on media? What are they, what are they missing out on when, on when they're approaching the issue of child soldiers? And I, whoever wants to go first, please do. And you can also crit critique us as well, or rest and George, your criticism towards us is welcome. The missing out is, for example, children coming from um, neighbor, sorry, nearby countries like uh, Syria and Iraq after the fall of the ISIS caliphate. And um, I mean, the extent to, I mean, irrespective of the extent to which these children were involved in war, there is a tendency or I would say tendency for over generalization. Oh, these children were indoctrinated, these children uh, will be prone to such contact in the future. Uh, these children should somehow uh, be dealt with. But I think the EU as well, even though it has uh, followed a consistent approach in agreeing with the ICC and the IHL framework, it has yet to adopt a uniform approach as to what happened with the returnees. Um, both adults and children who return from adult, uh, from conflict zones. So my my, my uh, I mean, um, in order to like uh, uh, reach a uh, final point is, I think there is a lack of a comprehensive framework as to what happened with people who come from conflict zone, whether these are children or adults. 
but in the last few years due to um, the advent of vices and other forms of extremism, uh, there has not been an adequate care with respect to properly reintegrating and taking care of these children. Now, we have spoken about child soldiers, but going back to basics, going back to the Convention of the Rights of the Child is about allowing a child to fulfill its development in terms of education, in terms of knowledge, in terms of activities. So we should place the child soldier phenomenon within, within this broader context as well. Uh, you started, uh, first of all, Joanna, would you like to add something before we move on, move on to the next question? Well, I, I, I would just um, uh, like to stress that uh, children associated with militias and armed groups should be treated primarily as victims. They were uh, uh, victims be before they uh, became perpetrators, and before all these, they were children. Children who have been abducted, recruited, uh, used, exposed to violence at an early age should not be rehabilitated, in brackets, but should also be empowered, provided with a clear reparations entitlement. All right. Uh, we started discussing. Uh, sorry. There's Wait a, a minute. Bag outside, sorry. Yeah, there's a noise. Dimitra, you started. Uh, the, you started uh, your critique. You, ext you extended your critique. Sorry, to the lack of a common framework. So, us being a, an EU member state, what is lacking in the EU legal frameworks right here, and also application? Uh, to protect uh, those children or uh, the issue of child soldiers? In like general, in the United Nations, because it's the largest frame of, uh, of uh, states, the United Nations. Yeah, also in that frame as well. Uh, in terms of the EU policy, and, uh, and this not, not only concerns children, it concerns uh, the phenomenon of returnees, also returnees foreign fighters. Uh, the EU has found itself in a difficult position in the last few years as to how to deal with these people. Sometimes it has refused to take them back. Sometimes it has allowed them to be transferred to other countries for trial. Sometimes it has taken them back. So this is what I mean. I meant beforehand with uh, the lack of a comprehensive framework. I mean, the um, Joanna, I think, mentioned it beforehand. Um, a large number, maybe, I don't know if it's the vast majority of foreign fighters who went to conflict zones came from EU member states, traveled from EU member states to go there. Mm -hmm. uh, Joanna, now, yes, go, Dimitra, go on, yeah. You want to add something? Now, in terms of the UN framework, um, in the UN framework, we have a number of fronts there uh, trying to take action, but it is a larger organization with its uh, pros and cons. We have the Convention on the Rights of the Child and obligations arising in the rain. We have the Commission, the High Commissioner on Human Rights. We have the Secretary General's um, Under Secretary for Children and Armed Conflict. There is action taking place on many fronts. Should we go to, to Joanna now, if you like something to add, Joanna? Yeah, sure. Um, uh, thank you, Dimitra. Um, well, I would just have to add that the comparison of jurisprudence of the international and regional human rights systems uh, reveal, uh, reveals that the, the approach to uh, reparation varies considerably depending on the applicable provision on reparation, uh, as well as the mandate and interpretation given by the relevant committee, court or commission. Uh, clearly, the regional human rights courts wield great advantages in their authority to order legally binding judgments. Uh, this has resulted in a significantly high compliance rate on reparations compared with the United Nations treaty bodies. Uh, although the jurisprudence contains variations, uh, there is convergence uh, within the international and regional systems on key points, such as the affirmation of 
positive obligations of the state and the responsibility to prevent and protect against violations, including those committed by non-state actors in the context of armed conflict. Um, the international and regional systems also differ regarding whether they consider individual or collective reparations measures. The United Nations Treaty Body System considers both aspects. While the decisions on individual petitions tend to take a restrictive approach, a more collective policy-oriented approach is applied in the recommendations contained in concluding uh, observations. Um, the European human rights system is faced with a sharp increase in cases of which an increasing number uh, have occurred in the context of armed conflict. Uh, while the European Court of Human Rights has uh, uh, traditionally been conservative with regard to reparations, it is important to acknowledge the precedent-setting role of the European Court of Human Rights and that it over time has developed an extensive and more victim-oriented jurisprudence. It is gradually moving towards emitting policy-oriented judgments in order to address the overlap and backlog of cases, of course. Um, and then the international, um, uh, the inter-American human rights system uh, has been uh, of key importance, but I won't go any further. Well, we have five minutes, man. What do we do? What, how do you feel, first of all? Uh, I'm feeling really depressed right now. It, it was a hot subject today, and we knew it. We knew it. I, I, we said before, are we going to be able to tackle it? I don't know if uh, Dimitra and Joanna think we have done a good job or not. I asked you before. Can I add a positive note? Please. Yes, please. Yes. 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 <laughs> we need that. I mean, 20 years or so ago, it would have been incomprehensible to say that someone could be convicted for the war crime of child soldiering. Exactly. Now he's firmly a part of international criminal law and uh, arguably international customary law. So. We are going in the right direction one way or another in terms of um, trying to deal with impunity, but there is still a long way to go. Uh, and of course, also uh, when it comes to reparations that uh, Joan has uh, very clearly set out previously. Huh, the long way to go, so the future. So what are the next steps? What should be improved? And uh, with the, what was the work needed to be done, not just on the legal level, but what do you expect also from us as uh, people with two microphones and uh, putting things on YouTube? Your lights. Well, first of all, yes, go on. <laughs> first of all, uh, uh, interviews like today's. Um, it, it has been a, um, a unique opportunity to, for me to talk about uh, child surgery. It's not something. Um, I've been speaking about Cyprus that, that we come, we, we discuss frequently. I don't know what's your take on it. I mean, you are uh, on the other side of the microphone, but I was quite surprised by the invitation, pleasantly surprised by the invitation. Well, we're pleasantly surprised at both of you uh, for coming <laughs> here. And we would like to, before we, we, we go to the concluding remarks, we would both like to repeat our thanks. Joanna, what is your concluding remarks for the last uh, couple of minutes we have for the show? The microphone is yours, Joanna. Well, the, uh, the logical consequence of the recognition of human rights as used, Kogan, implies that the individuals appear as rights bearers or subjects in general international law, having afforded individuals such standing uh, in international law, the need to translate consequences of breaches such as reparations in favor of individual victims because, becomes apparent. The right of individuals to receive reparations for serious violations is an indispensable corollary in order to provide an effective remedy for the violations uh, suffered by these children. As noted by Judge Higgins, rights suppose a correlative obligation on the part of the state. Without a remedy, a right may be uh, an empty shell. Any last words? Anyone? Dimitri, uh, you yes. have a last word. Okay, go on. Just a concluding remark on reparations. I mean, we have taken it for granted, but reparations takes many forms. It's compensation. 
uh, an individual receiving a monetary value is restitution, trying to bring the individual to their original situation as much as possible. It's a guarantee that something will not occur again. So what, what would perceive as a reparations is a multifaceted uh, tool which can be adjusted according to the specific conflict and the circumstances of the conflict or the individuals who have suffered in that conflict. So it's not a fixed uh, tool, it's a tool which can be tailored to the circumstances and individuals. Well, from my side, I have nothing else to add rather than thank you both uh, Joanna Dimopoulou and Dimitra Loizu for joining us and taking uh, time from your personal time and from your work to come and share with us here uh, in the studio, but also anyone listening or viewing this video. Thank you very much. Thank you, George. What is your final take? I would like to thank also Joanna and Dimitra for being here today, well, at least uh, virtually. Um, and I couldn't have done it without you, George. So yes. thank you. Believe me, it was I, I told you it was it's gonna be very hard. Are we gonna be able to do it? And I can't believe one hour passed. I wanna finish. Uh, yes, finish off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you for trying with us and raise awareness about this subject. At least for us, this is the best we can do for now. I think everyone Thank should you. try to do the best, their best. Thank you so much for your invitation. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Dimitra. Thank you, Joanna. And thank you for to our listeners for bearing with us and to for taking things in. And let's hope for our best. I hope uh, we have done a decent job here, all the four of us. Okay. Absolutely. <laughs>